Here we are. Welcome to the physics video lecture. Physics 4B video lecture 23. We're starting a new chapter. It's called magnetic induction and I'm going to call it Faraday's law. That's our main uh, emphasis. So what chapter number is that? 28. Faraday's Law. Actually, it's called magnetic inductance, but... So, Faraday's Law is going to be the last of the major laws of electricity and magnetism that we're assembling now. And I'm going to begin by discussing just an example of a phenomenon that we can kind of imagine. We're going to have a B field that is into the board everywhere. So the entire board has a B field into it in space. And we have, so over here as well, and we have a conducting rod and it's moving to the right with velocity V. So the conducting rod is moving here to the right with velocity V. I'll write that down so we have it moving uh, to the right with velocity V, okay? So what happens if there's a conducting rod here? We have to imagine there are charge carriers inside of it. It's moving to the right here in the B field. Well, remember we have the force on those charges. We're thinking of the force on the charges that occupy the inside of the conducting rod. Q, V cross B. So we take V to the right and cross it into the board and we have a vector that's pointing up. So we end up with positive charge up here and negative charge down there. So we end up with a charge separation. So all right, we get charge separation. And now we're just going to draw some consequences from this. So we've got the charge separation. And that means, since we have the charge separation, that there's a E field. rod okay, pointing from plus to minus and therefore an EMF, an electromotive force, a voltage, but we'll use the letter uppercase epsilon here like that, is equal to E times L. So let's keep going. In equilibrium now, so this thing is moving across, it's just moving across to the right, and we've established an equilibrium. In equilibrium, this E field is going to be equal to or the force due to the E field. So Q times E is going to be equal to Q V B. So E is equal to V times B. Okay, right? The, the electric force across the across the separation, the magnetic force. That's what we're saying here. So F sub E is equal to F sub B, and we can therefore say that E is equal to B times B, so that E is equal to B, B, and now we're going to plug that in, and our EMF is going to be this voltage B times B times L. V 
BBL, and we're going to call that the motional EMF. Motional EMF. And notice as soon as you stop moving, it, it depends on B, stop moving, you have you lose it. So if you're moving, you're getting this motional EMF. Remember that's a voltage potential. Okay. So the next thing we're going to do, we have this idea of the motional EMF. We're going to construct a circuit. So I need more room, I'll set this up here. So we got this motional EMF up there, just from this bar moving to the right. Now we're going to put it on, uh, construct a circuit with it. So we're looking at the same scenario. So next. Same configuration. Um, with conducting rails. So conducting rails. So here's the idea, we have, we still have the B field into the board everywhere, but now we have these conducting rails across which we're sliding that conducting rod. Okay. This thing's still going forward with B. And these conducting rails, we can even imagine connect them with the circuit there. And remember, since the pluses were here and the minuses were there, we're going to get a current. It's going around here counterclockwise. And if we have, you know, we have an EMF voltage, we have a current, we have a resistor there, we're going to be, we're going to be able to burn some energy there. Basically, this thing's going to use some power. Okay. So let's go ahead and write that down. So we've got that completed circuit. Okay, completed circuit. So let's analyze this circuit. Well, it's just we're going to use Ohm's law on it now. So we get I is equal to V over R, V over R, and power P is going to be I squared P. Actually, we're not going to use that one. We're going to use squared over R. Okay, so that's the power formula we can use. We have a voltage squared over resistance. Um, and here I'll also put V L V over R. Okay. So that's the power in a circuit. If you think of this as a voltage source as it's going across, as long as it's moving, you get that uh, motional EMF, and that's the basic power formula. Okay, so now we have to analyze this because where's the power coming from? So next. What is the source of the power? What is the power source? Question. Okay, we can actually do this on this board right here. So here's the idea now. We have this, we've established motional EMF. I'll use a different color here. We have current flowing here counterclockwise. We want to know the source of power. Well, let's use the force formula for a current. Recall F is equal to I 
L cross B. Well, I'm going to have to establish a separation length here. That's the length of our bar that's going across those rails. So the current's well defined, it's going along this direction, the black arrow. We cross it into the board and we get a force that's pointing to the left. Okay. So if I have, just for the sake of argument, I hat and J hat, you know, in these horizontal X and Y directions, then I can say this is I L B in the minus I hat direction, minus I hat direction. Okay, so this is important. Because what that means is there's, if I push, you know, if this bar is being moved to the right, there's a resisting force to the left. Okay, so if this were a machine and I were pushing this thing, I would be pushing against a resistive force. Okay, okay so we're pushing against this. Um, here, let's send this up. Expending energy, I'm pushing against this force to the left. So note, opposite the direction of motion. That's the electromagnetic force on that bar, and if, you know someone's going to have to push it to overcome that force. So that's the point. Now, what about the power? Now, power is work per time, okay? And work is force times displacement. Here I'll go to, so work is F times delta X and time is delta T. So F delta X over delta T is F times V, okay? And now we can say that is our F, which is I L B times V. B L B over R equals P over R. That's our current times E, that's that BLD, same as up there, equals E squared over R. So this is a great punchline. What have we found? This is mechanical power that we're doing to push this bar across the magnetic field on those rails, and that mechanical power, E squared over R, is exactly the same as the power that's being burn here in the resistor. Okay. So what this is, is a conversion of mechanical energy to electrical energy. So yeah, these two things, I'll name one of them star, this is double star, and this is star. So what we're going to note that um, star that electrical energy or electrical power equals double star for mechanical power. So what we have is a generator. Okay? This is, of course, don't try to build this. It's not going to be the most efficient way to generate electrical power, but in principle, it's doing it, and that's what. That's what we need right here. So we have that conversion of mechanical to electrical power 
and we're going to continue analyzing this thing because this machine really uh, delivers. Okay. So so far so good. That's just the conversion of mechanical to electrical power. Okay. Can't stress that enough. What we're going to do next is continue this analysis in a slightly different direction. We're going to introduce the idea of magnetic flux. So magnetic flux B sub D. We've had electrical flux before. And so now it's the magnetic field times an area. So magnetic field and times an area. And what we see is we have a magnetic flux because we have the area of the loop and we've got a magnet going right through it. So there's magnetic flux in this machine up here. do more or less complicated magnetic flux calculations, but I want to re, I want to continue to analyze this thing, but I got to free up some board space. Um, so yeah, we'll redraw it. So we're going to do this analyze the magnetic flux aspect of this this machine here, this emotional EMF machine. So we'll label it as follows. We have, once again, B field everywhere into the board. We have our two rails here. We're moving forward with B conducting rails. Now we're interested in the magnetic flux. These and the board everywhere. So we have to label this thing. It's L, and we'll call this length x here. So the magnetic flux through this loop, P sub B here is. B sub B is equal to B, and the area is L times X. B times area, L times X. Now we're going to do the change, the rate of change of the magnetic flux, because this thing's apparently increasing, right? The bar's moving to the right. So D, P sub B, DT is equal to B, L, D, X, D, T, X is what's changing, is equal to B, L, V, which is our emotional EMF again. Emotional EMF. So this is a more general form of what we've just done. And this is an example of Faraday's law. Faraday's law that is is that this EMF is equal to minus the magnetic flux minus the time derivative of the magnetic flux. Now the minus sign I'm going to justify in a moment but for the moment we'll just uh, accept this. This has to do with the fact with the directionality of the current that it opposes the change in flux. So you actually have to have a minus sign here. Um, but yeah, that's Faraday's law. Let's see if we have anything else to say about that. The thing we have to say about this is it's an example of what we did right here, but it's far, far more general. Um, there's a bunch of demonstrations that we have backstage that I can't show you this time around. 
in which any way that you change this flux whatsoever will generate an EMF. Okay. So for example, um, well let me write that down first and then we'll, we'll move on. So. so this is um, general, this is, a, this is a very general statement. This holds So I'll just write any change of flux. Okay. So any change of flux, we can even start with this example here. What would be another way to get a change of flux? We, got, we did get a change of flux by sliding the bar to the right okay, because the flux was increasing, therefore it's a change of flux. But what if we just kept the bar fixed and then our emotional EMF, you know, says V equals zero, nothing going on. We keep the bar fixed here, and then we just increase the power of the V field. Make it stronger. Well, that's going to be a change of flux, right, with respect to time. And that, what's that, what is that going to do? It's going to give us uh, an EMF in the circuit as well. But suppose we just increase the power of the field now we don't have an argument for what's the direction of the, um, of the polarity or the direction of the resulting current. So that's what we have to work through. Um, the, and that will, that will also correspond to this B sub B. So I'm going to set this up and redraw it now. Yeah, there are many ways to change the flux, and this holds, you know, true regardless of how you change the flux. So now let's set that up. But we'll keep working with that, you know, with a loop there because it's it's a good one. into the board again and there's our conducting current loop okay conducting loop and our example is B is increasing so suppose B is increasing clearly there's a change in flux now, what we have to have there, so we're going to generate a current around this loop. The current has to oppose the change of flux. The induced current produces a V field, produces its own V field and that V field has to oppose the change of flux which must oppose the change of flux so having written this down we'll explain it change of flux and you'll see immediately why this has to be the case so first of all, the change of flux is into the board. Now, if we have a counterclockwise current and we use our right-hand rule, we know that this counterclockwise current will produce V field out of the board within, okay, producing induced V field inside the loop that's coming out of the board, okay? And that is a flux, that's its own flux with an opposite sign because the change of flux is into the board. This is opposing the change of flux. Okay. And of course, right, this is just Ampere's law and outside it has that, but these into the board ones are outside the loop, they don't count, okay? 
they don't they don't contribute to that flux in, you know through that loop. Okay. Um, now here's the reason it has to be this way. The opposite direction would produce the same flux into the board and it would just be an infinite feedback loop. It would keep getting stronger and stronger that would violate energy conservation. So it really has to oppose it there. So once again, the induced current produces its own B field, which must oppose the change of flux and that's called Lenz's law. Lenz's law. So you can always you know, in your mind, figure out what the direction of the induced B field is, and, and that tells you the polarity. Now, formally, if we go back to this expression, we can uh, justify the minus sign as well, okay? So what I'm going to do, it's best to keep working with this square, uh, Let's keep working with this square circuit. Although it's true for any shape, right? Any shape. Um, before I move on, what's another way to change the flux? Another way to change the flux would be, imagine that we've got this loop here and the B field is into the board, okay? Say the loop is my notebook here. If I turn, this notebook 90 degrees. In other words, if I turn this loop 90 degrees, there's now no flux through it at all, right? Because the field would just be parallel to the loop there. Once again, turn this 90 degrees, B field this way, no flux. Well, it went from flux to no flux. That's a change of flux. There's also going to be an induced current. And uh, now you can even see where the generator is. We just keep spinning this thing in the B field, and we're going to get change of the flux as much as we need. Okay. So when we when we start talking about generators and transformers, well, that comes later. But generators and motors will be using this principle here. It'll be a loop. We'll turn it. Okay, good. I want to go back to the Faraday's law formulation and put it into a more math or a Slightly different mathematical form. Better consult the clock here. Okay, great. So since I'm using this, I'll go ahead and erase this picture. This is really important. We'll do a couple of homework problems on it. There's a lot of these fun little, little puzzle type of problems. Um, but yeah, we want to put this into an integration form. So we can actually uh, keep using that picture up there. So we want to put Faraday's law so Faraday's law can be expressed in terms of integrals. put into an integral form and we're looking at this loop here so let's go ahead and take a loop we've got our B field into the board since that's what we've been using okay we got this current loop here and rewrite this minus D magnetic flux dt. Well, so what is this EMF in terms of an electric field? It is a line integral of the electric field dotted into you know, a line element around a closed loop. So if we integrate here counterclockwise, you may remember from calculus, this counterclockwise is the positive orientation when you're looking at a loop like this. Okay. So this E in the direction, that would give us, in this particular case that we've been studying, this would be a positive number. Okay. This would be a positive because the DS and the E are in the same direction.
Good. Now, what about the right side? Well, the flux is a surface integral, so we can we'll put the minus d over dt out here. And this would be the B field, that's the B flux, B dot D area, I'll call it. B dot D area. And um, this is the surface area bounded by this curve. So this is the curve of the contour, and this is the surface bounded by the curve. Surface bounded by the curve. And when you do a surface bounded by a curve and the positive orientation is to the left, then the surface normal is pointing out. Okay. Surface normal is pointing out of the board by the positive orientation, but the B field was pointing in, so B dot DA is negative, and then we have minus sign makes it positive. Okay. This was for our example where this thing was moving to the right. And so yeah, this is what guarantees Lenz's law, the minus sign, and so forth. So you're, you've got a curve with its positive orientation, you've got a surface bounded by the curve with its surface normal orientation. So this is the integral form of Faraday's law. And we're going to put all of our laws, actually we now have all of the laws of electromagnetism, we've talked about them all. We're going to put them all in integral form and then work around them a little bit. Um, but once again, electric field dot ds, that's going around here. And E times length is a voltage, right? Electric field times length element is a voltage. So you go around here, this closed loop, you've got a voltage from having gone, gone all around there. And that's equal to minus ddt of the flux of the magnetic field through the inside of that loop there. So again, this totally generalizes right here. It's literally what we saw with this ex with that example up there, but it generalizes to any change of flux whatsoever. Okay. Then and it doesn't have to be a flat curve, but it does have to be a closed curve. Okay, once again, I'll consult the clock. Okay, perfect. I'm going to put up some homework problems and get them started, and then I'll continue with this material. Um, okay, let's we'll set this up. Next here. This one was pretty, you know, this, everything we've done here was trivial because it was just, uh, you know, surface area times B field. They can be a little more involved than that. So yeah, we'll do, we'll do Faraday's law. Um, and we'll do another example of a flux. Magnetic flux example. In fact, I think I have a homework problem on this exactly. So, suppose we have a current carrying wire and we have a loop here. Okay. And you know, we can 
give it some dimensions in a moment. If we have a square loop, we have a current carrying wire. Is there a flux through this loop? Well, we know from the right-hand rule that there's a B field due to this wire. And what do we have? B is equal to mu naught I over two pi R, where R is the distance from here. So yeah, let's give this some dimensions. We have um, W and L, and we have to have a distance A from that wire there. And our magnetic flux, and in fact it's magnitude, because the B field is into the board and the, and the surface normal's out, so we're just gonna be doing its magnitude is equal to um, B integral B D area. Okay. Integral B D area. So let's make this a little more concrete. We're going to have a mu naught I <coughs> over 2 pi R for the B field and the D area is going to be L, we need a, so here's an x-axis, we need an x-axis, good. So what's the area element going to be? It's going to be, uh, D area is going to be L dx. And we can pull this out, we've got mu naught I L over 2 pi, but now this 2 pi r we could have actually called 2 pi x because x is the distance from this line right there. So we'll go ahead and call that x. So mu naught i l over 2 pi integral dx over x, and we take it from a over here to a plus w at the top. So that would be a flux. For that loop. Okay. Now, that's not a flux that's changing, but how could we change that flux? Okay. Forget the absolute values here, but just keep it simple. We've got the flux there. So you do the integration, I think your homework problem is going to be like this. So you do the integration, and but now you can ask how could we change that flux? Any number of ways we could change the current. Okay. We could change the current so the current increases in time, and the flux would be increasing in time. What else could we change? Well, this distance A, which is going to be part of the answer, could be changing in time. So dA dt if we're moving this thing to the right, that would change the flux as well. Okay. So, um, and that would just be with this expression, you know, we could also twist this thing around its axis, do other things. Um, but yeah, in this particular case, change the current or change the position, distance and A, to change the flux. Good, so yeah, that's a homework problem example. I'm gonna go, consult the book now and see what we're going to have. Yeah, they have a good section on motional EMF. They have a couple of good problems on that. So at the end of the hour, I will add a few of these problems. There's some good problems here. So what I want to do now is begin 
writing out all of the laws of electricity and magnetism uh, that we have found in this integral form like that one up there. So I'll go ahead and leave that up there. And write down the laws of electricity and magnetism. Because in a sense, we found all of the um, all of the fundamental laws, and there are many applications. Right, we have to talk about motors and what have you. But uh, what we're going to do is write down the laws and do this analysis of them, and then jump forward a couple chapters and then jump back again. So you're going to have to bear with me on this. So here we go. Let's call this laws of electricity and magnetism. in integral form. So I think what I'll do is just write them all down. There's this one and three more. And then we'll start to discuss them. So the first one was referred to as Gauss's Law. And the integral form of it was integral P dot D area closed surface integral equals Q and closed by that surface divided by epsilon naught. The second one, I'll call this Gauss's law sub E second one is Gauss's law for magnetic fields, and that was that the closed surface integral B dot BA is equal to zero. So let's remind ourselves of what the content of these was, because it may have been a little while. This was actually equivalent to Coulomb's law. Okay. It was the generalization of Coulomb's law. If you take a point charge at the center of this circle, you found out that the E field was equal to Q over 4 pi epsilon naught R squared, which is basically Coulomb's law. Well, but this is a note here. If we have a point charge at the origin, then E equals Q over 4 pi epsilon naught R squared, as we, as we recall, and the field times the unit vector. Okay. So yeah, Gauss's law is equivalent to Coulomb's law. Now what about Gauss's law for the B field? This is equivalent to, and I, I mentioned that the other day, to the fact that the B field has no, uh, that you cannot isolate a B field pole. You can't isolate a north or south pole. They always come together. So this one means that there are no magnetic monopoles. Monopoles and that also means cannot isolate a north or south pole. Isolate north or south pole. Um, and what that means is you've got as much flux leaving a surface as you have coming back in. So these are both for closed surfaces. The third one that we have last time was Ampere's law, and we had already we had already um, modified it a bit to the Ampere-Maxwell law, and that was that the line integral of v dot d s. Around 
on the closed curve was equal to mu naught i enclosed, all right, enclosed, plus mu naught epsilon naught. And then we had a d phi, so it's e d t, okay, that we had added there. And this we added because if we're crossing a gap, we needed to make sure this still worked. This here was just the uh, example I had up there a while ago, field of a long straight wire. Right? You went around a circle around the field of a long straight wire, mu naught times i uh, piercing that thing. So that was Ampere Maxwell, and now we have Faraday. So let's even put that here. Or Faraday's law. And we just found it. E dot ds, also around the closed loop, is equal to minus ddt d dot d area. So yeah, that's, that's everything so far. Also, and we used that to actually to generate this, we have um, M mass times acceleration of a charged particle is equal to Q times E plus Q B cross B. So here, on one board, we've got the complete electromagnetic theory in its an integral form, as well as this is for the motion of charged particles. Particles in the field. I'll just write. Okay. So again, we need to be able to go back to the examples we had and be able to recognize how these work. And for example, this one here, if you go back to the point charge of the origin, you find this E field, which is basically Coulomb's law. Um, the no magnetic monopoles, how did we prove that? What we basically saw was that a, 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 a current loop, a little circular current loop produces a dipole field, and uh, that current loop is as thin as anything can be, right? ideally thin, and there's no isolating a, a north or south pole on it. So no magnetic monopoles and uh, that can then be expressed in terms of Gauss's law for the field like this. Again, this here is the original Ampere's law. This expression was added to it um, to account for when you're crossing a gap in space and you have a change in E field there, um, which plays the role of a current. In fact, this here was called the displacement current. So it just played, it was the role of this current, this is the current in the wires, and this is the current across the gap. Displacement current. Good, so we have, we have good examples for all of these. Faraday we just saw today, very concrete example. Ampere's law, just to remind you of the Ampere's law here, if you're doing that circular field around a long straight wire, this left side turns into B times two pi r, and the right side turns into mu naught i, and then you end up with B equals mu naught i over two pi r, which is just the standard field there. Okay. Um, so that's Ampere Maxwell. Let me consult the clock once again.
Okay, here's what we're going to do before I write up the homework assignment and discuss that for a moment. We're going to work with these equations next time and uh, just in the symbolic level, we have to bring them all into an integral form. So we need integrals, just as in Faraday, we've got an integral on the right side. We're gonna do that for both, of, for all three of these, all four of these, this one's already done, it's a zero. And then we're going to turn them into differential equations. But so far we have the, you know, the content of everything we've done where we can actually give examples for it, even though it's in this abstract form. Okay, now I'm going to find some homework problems in text. So we're in chapter 28, and this would be homework 23. Problem 28 is the one I set up. For problem 28, we set up, I set up on the board with that integration, and they just want to have you put some numbers in there. So it's a good magnetic flux problem. Um, good, so far that's all we'll do. And then there's, there are some motional EMF problems. Now, problem 38 is my whole discussion of motional EMF. So that'll just be a good review. Look at that. They, um, yeah, perfect. They have, they have some numbers there, okay? But it's, it's the problem that we did to discuss all of this. And there's a tricky and more difficult one that I think I'll have you guys try as well. In problem 43, let me show you what 43 is. 43 is our EMF machine, except the rails are on a downhill slope. So the conducting rails are like this, and this bar is now sliding down the hill frictionless. And let's see what they give us. They give us a B field, yeah, they give us a separation L, they gave us an angle theta. So it's a little bit tricky. The B field is in this vertical direction, so there's going to be a scalar product involved. Current will be in the opposite direction. That's no no problem. Um, yeah, it's you know it's very close to what we did, except there's a scalar product because of the B field uh, and the angle here. So if you can do problem 43, it's just more a little more complicated version of what we did. The point is is that this thing, as it slides down, it's going to reach a terminal speed because the force, the gravitational force component pushing it down and the magnetic, you know, electromagnetic force pushing it up, down and south. So you'll find the terminal speed. Good problem. So yeah, these three uh, you'll find interesting. Good practice with the concepts. And then we're gonna return to all of this next time. Good, see you guys then.